Welcome to Charge Your Voice podcast. We're here at Exposure International Photography Festival 2024. I'm your host, Neil Bailey, and I'm here with Britta Yashinsky. So, Britta, over 20 years as a professional photographer here at Exposure, exhibiting for the first time. So, uh, born in Germany, living in England. Correct. And um, tell us, how did you get started in photography, which brought you on this journey to bring us, really bring you here to us at Exposure? So I think I was always creative. I was always interested in just creating something. And uh, I quite early realized that I can create a voice for somebody or something else. Um, so I think I probably picked photography because it sounds crazy, but I felt I was quite good at it. So I think if I didn't discover photography and had a talent for something else, like let's say writing, I mean, although I do quite love writing, um, maybe I would have... So for me, it's more about the mission than the photography, if you see what I mean. I love creating and I love photography, but if you took the camera away from me, which would be heartbreaking, but mm. if you did, I would continue working in the same area mm. uh, to give a voice to animals in a different way, not through pictures, but probably through text or video or, you know, I would find my way. So your medium to tell the story is the camera. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tool. You know, for me, photography is a tool to um, make change, to bring change. Did you grow up with a camera in your hand or was it something you picked up? I mean, I, like, nobody gave me a camera, but I have to say that so my dad's camera was actually a Leica. <laughs> and I just, I loved the design of it. I didn't know what kind of photos it would take, but I just loved the look of it. Mm. I just occasionally would touch it and go, wow, that's such a beautiful design. <laughs> um and uh, so my own photography really started a bit later. I was really interested in arts, like in painting and drawing. And I did a lot of that when I was a child. And I looked at, so I think my influence is actually more painting, abstract painting actually, rather than photography, to be honest. But uh, so this was early and uh, I loved reading books. So I was really inspired by, by the arts. And it was later that I then decided to do an apprenticeship in Germany to become a photographer but then that was very commercial and after a few years I felt well is this what I'm going to do with the rest of my life how long is an apprenticeship in Germany? three years and so you have it's sort of is it like college or is it you really no I mean you really work well you partly go to school but you you basically you work for a company um, you learn the skill the craft of photography I really learned it uh, so I learned how to set light and I learned I mean I learned technically everything um, but then I felt, okay, now I know the technical stuff, but like it felt a bit empty. Um, so I thought I, I need to put my photography into good use, uh, which is when I decided to go to England um, to study photography there. So I then studied for three years photography and that's really when I became a real photographer, you know, how I see what photography um, well, it's, it's, it's important for me, the photography. I mean, there's other photographers who might say, well, advertising is more important to them or whatever. But for me, I felt always deep in my heart, I wanted to make somehow a difference. I mean, actually, mm. funny enough, my parents always thought I was going to become a politician because I was always very engaged and mm. I was very hungry for information and news and understanding what's going on in the world. Did you feel that the three years you spent in photography school in England fostered that? feeling in you more Very because much. They, they weren't sort of training you to be a commercial photographer they were just training you in photography do you know what there was one particular teacher i had tony maestri mm. he didn't teach me anything about photography but i didn't need that because i knew the photography part he taught me about philosophy i mean the only thing we discussed was never photography it was always philosophy and life and the combination of my technical skills I had from Germany and the deep conversations I had with them about life just, you know, created this, uh, you know, th this sort of feeling of like, now I know what to do. You know, I use my photography as a tool to, to, to shift things. To so, you came, things. so you came straight out of photography school and what did you go into? Did you immediately go into that line? Uh, yes, very much. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of financed my work I wanted to do through working in a picture archive. So my, my first steps was actually refiling transparencies, slides and negatives. I mean, that was like a wonderful time. If I, I still have sort of a memory of the smell of this place. It was full of filing cabinets, 
with negatives and transparencies and very photo boxes memorable with smell. Yeah, with yeah, with photographic prints in it. I mean everything that you know, tactile stuff, you know. Of course it's a completely different world now. But I loved working there actually to be honest. And it was a really it was a great way to finance my photography I wanted to do. So at the beginning, I didn't even try to make money with my photos. I kind of just wanted to kind of get better and better at it before. I because you had your regular job paying the way. Yeah, I had my job in this archive, basically. And, uh, and of course, there were some amazing photographers there as well, you know, like which I, I then met, you know, kind of some of the older guys, the people that have been around for a while, you know, the photographers who worked for, you know, all the big newspapers. And, you know, Do you think that helped you develop your style as photography because you saw so many different styles of work or did you just come up with no um probably not actually i think it, it encouraged me to put myself out there at some point with my own pictures but i don't think i was sort of influenced by the photos i mean as i said so my influence is probably more reading and and painting like abstract painting is kind of what i feel i mean if you look at my pictures you might sort of understand what i'm talking about i mean i don't so for me for example I'm not saying that it's always successful, but I try to take photos nobody has ever seen before, <laughs> literally. I mean, it sounds really arrogant, but when I look through the viewfinder and I feel, oh, so many people have done that, I, I, what's the point in you know, pressing the shutter, basically? So I, I just always try to kind of find something else. And it's very much like, you know, the 3H, which is like the head, heart, and hand combination. is the kind of Rudolf Steiner theory I don't know if you know about it but it's like I don't believe in that you can just with your head create something or, or make anything happen or just with your heart or just with your hands actually I think you need to have a combination of all three and I think that's what happens I mean I really love sort of dreaming up projects and dreaming up how I'm going to take the photos not that I every time I set out fully know how I'm going to take the photos but I have an idea so when I rock up at places for example I'm sorry I'm going to jump ahead a bit but just to say how I work creatively creatively is, um, so let's say I have a backdrop and I'm like, yeah, I want to I shoot something on this backdrop and I want to make it look like still life. And then I rock up where special agents work or like border force, you know, like governments. And they go like, what are you doing here? Like, this is not a photo studio. This is like the back rooms of confiscated wildlife items. And I'm like, I know guys, but would you trust me if I set something up, please? And they go like, Okay, and they kind of roll their eyes, going, like, "Oh my God, you're too typical woman." Um, you know, let's see what she's going to do. You know, an artist. But anyway, then I take the photos, and then I show them, and, and then they, they like it. Yeah. And then they go, "Oh my God, wow! Okay, oh, oh, wow! That's that's really interesting. Totally different approach." And oh my God, you probably get a lot of attention for this. And like, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> So, you know, there's a lot of photography out there and I feel, you know, I want to, every time I want to do something different. I mean, I might do a repeat of then once I found something, like, you know, the current uh, work I have of confiscated wildlife items, you know, which I call wildlife or um, commodity. Um, you know, the, what I exhibit here is exposure is the, you know, the ruthless icons, you know, of this trade basically. And um, <laughs> you're going to have to cut this out. I completely messed up my title just now. Did you? <laughs> yes. Well, it is yours, right? So the title is White Life or Commodity, Icons of a Ruthless Trade. So people have said to me... Are you sure about that? How many more photos are you going to take? Because I've been doing it for a few years. Mm. And I say, I don't know. Why? <laughs> Why are you even asking me? You know, so I'm, I'm pretty much following just what I want to do. I've never really listened to, I've been criticized a lot in our like, okay, let me take you back to college. Mm. So all this Britta again, oh yeah, like, you know, for weeks and weeks, she's been going to the zoo, taking pictures of zoo pictures, like animals again. Okay, but yeah, so I did this then for two years, actually. I made this my project at college, but guess what? I was the only one walking out with a book contract afterwards. Yeah, because I stuck to it. And we had external examiners, and one of them was from Fiden Press, who then invited me, you know, to do a book on Zoo. And all the other students had criti criticized me for two years, when like, okay. So, yeah, I think sticking with the subject can really help. But also, you know, I don't, so I don't really care, you know, if people don't like my work. Um, I just, I do what I feel really inside me that works for me. 
Mm. And I need to I need to really love my pictures. Yeah. And I think also people see that. I mean, I obviously now in this stage of my life, I get a lot of young photographers, new photographers contacting me uh, for advice, some kind of help, portfolio reviews, mentorships and whatever. And then they sent me their portfolio. And I too many times I have to say I see really unloved pictures. And I say that to the people. I was like, do you know what? Work on this and send me the send me photos again that you love. when you have created something you really like. And they go, oh, okay, I'm not really sure. And then and then they come back and I'm like, yeah, actually, there's an improvement. I can see it. Do you think they're shooting what they think they're supposed to take? Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. And sometimes I feel it's really empty, which, by the way, is also why I'm not so scared of AI. At the moment, I'm not, because all I can see is empty shells. I don't see it as anything resonating at all. I mean, I'm sure AI will improve somehow, and I think there is a place by AI. But in the area of work, you know, where I'm, it's, kind of, it's evidence. You know, I document evidence, and I show that to authorities or charities, um, governments even. You know, that's something you can't create that, you know, with mm. AI. So mm. I don't feel so threatened by it. So you were working in your archive and starting to shoot your pictures. Where did things go from there? Yeah, I mean, at some point... You know, because I then had this... Uh, so the book was in the making when I started working for this contract. Then the, once the book was published, which actually, to be honest, took quite a long time. Um, so they picked me up on, we want to do your book in 93, something like that. And then the book was published in 96. So it took a long time. But then once, and all that time I worked on this archive. But then once the book was published, it happened quite quickly that lots of people came to me and gave me assignments. I, I sold a lot of prints actually a lot of people really liked it like collectors museums um and uh, yeah it sort of like really happened without me putting a lot of i mean i you know i wasn't really calling around or it's, you were putting your energy in a different direction and it, i mean and i just really kept taking photos mm -hmm. and and i was you know because i i wasn't at that time i wasn't financially depending on it i just really wanted to kind of just chisel away on my on my pictures basically and really focus on that and so I think that kind of was worked really well for me but then there was at some point the jump I had to make the jump of just becoming 100% professional photographer and it really felt like a jump as a in the in the, in the side of the you know, what do you call it the deep end of the, right. the water it like was completely I couldn't let go of your steady job and you know listen I really I mean this was a bit crazy but I actually really think it's the only way to do it it's almost like you pull the carpet away underneath your feet, your safety. You need to do it to actually go for it, I think. When I was starting um, writing for a living, I met a very famous writer, and he said, what do you call a taxi driver working on a novel, young man? Mm. Taxi driver? He said, yes, exactly. Writers write. And that was, that was his bit of advice, yeah. you know. And, you know, I mean, I think, there's something in that. I really think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I obviously now I meet a lot of, you know, the young photographers who, you know, I mean, they can't really survive on photography. And sometimes when they say they do, I then say, where do you live? And they say, oh, I live with my parents. I'm like, so actually you're not surviving <laughs> yeah. with your photography. I mean, could you feed a family, you know? Yeah. This is the key, right? So, and then I do say to people, you know, kind of stop the safety. Stop the safety and just go for it, you know? Because then I think if you put the pressure on yourself, that's when you can actually really succeed, I think. But, you know, it's also difficult. I don't know what it's like being 20 now, you know, so I really haven't got a clue. I'm, I'm just really lucky and I feel every day really privileged and super lucky that I'm actually making a living with photography mm. and that I can feed a family with it. Um, do you feel like the comp there's so much more competition today? Or do you think it, that hasn't changed? No, that hasn't changed. It's still the same? I would say so, yeah. I mean, mm. on the professional level, yes. I mean, there's lots of amateur photographers out there, but they don't do what I do. Mm. <laughs> you know, they probably compete but more with the wildlife or the travel photography, but they can't compete with what I do because they wouldn't get access to what I do. Mm. You know, this is probably uh, my big advantage. And it's not even that I was planning all of that. I literally just... <laughs> so you've made, you made the jump. Where did you go when you jumped? Yeah, I mean, I just kind of just ended up really getting a lot of assignments and I traveled quite a lot. And uh, were you then, where, What were your travels mainly taking you at that point? I mean, pretty much all over the place. I mean, I can't even begin. I mean, really, I, I traveled <laughs> sort of everywhere. I mean, the only place I never went to, strangely, was South, South America. But I did that last year or two years ago, actually. I finally went to South America 
uh, amazing job um, with the IUCN. Uh, it was actually about illegal gold mining. It was pretty dangerous. Maybe I shouldn't say this on this podcast. I don't know. But it was, you know, it was basically the connection between the illegal wildlife trade and illegal mining. You know, what, how does that connect? So this is like, for me, the amazing thing is like that every project and every job I have is so interesting. Mm -hmm. So I never have a day that's the same as the, the, the other day. Um, so it's so, you know, every day is a new thing. It's a different thing. And then, of course, also, you know, all the festivals, the exhibitions I have. Uh, I mean, the, can I just say this festival? I'm blown away by exposure. Totally blown away by it. Um, the voice this festival gives to photographers. I mean, I, th I think that's really important mm. now because it's so difficult for photographers. I mean, look, a lot of magazines wouldn't publish a lot of stuff that's exhibited here or what photographers show on stage here is not published because I think magazines are really worried about losing their readers, if you say the truth. Uh, you know, people want pretty pictures. I think after the pandemic, people are a bit low and a bit depressed. So if you then, on top of that, show war and destruction and, you know, the illegal wildlife trade and how we lose in our wildlife, you know, biodiversity loss is huge, climate change. Look, you know, um, you know, if you show, if you bombard that, you know, if you give that to your readers, Listen. they're going to they're stop looking at it. They, people can't cope. And, and I think this is right now a really big problem on the planet. People can't cope with the bad news anymore. There is so much of it. Mm. I mean, just walking around here, the exhibitions here, it's there's so much destruction. Like yesterday, I looked, you know, I looked at every caption of all these, like for example, the conflict photographers, and I kept thinking to myself, for what, for what? I see little children who have lost their legs, for what? So there's like one person on this planet who decides to just start bombing a country. I mean, look, you know, it's obviously there's so much destruction at the moment. Like in my lifetime, I've not seen this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we we're going to go with this. And it's sometimes it's to be honest, I think it's sometimes hard to get out of bed. Um, but so far, I still manage doing it because because I have made changes with my through my pictures, mm -hmm. and that gives me huge amounts of hope. Can you talk about your gallery and maybe just kind of you know, explain mm -hmm. some of the imagery? Um, yeah, I mean, so it started really with the with the concept of like, wouldn't it be amazing if I could find out what smuggled? I mean, and where does the stuff go that's confiscated? And I contacted the U.S. because a friend of mine actually told me that he went to this place um, where they were storing items. I'm so interesting because he said, this could be interesting for you. So anyway, I contacted them and that was in Denver, Colorado, where it's a huge warehouse where everything confiscated at any border point in the U.S. gets taken there. Um, and it's you know, kept for forensic tests, for education, but also, I think, to make sure it's not going back to the black market. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say, so I, con I contacted them and it took a long time. To, did it? Um, it took like a year for me to get in there, which is why I think not many people go because it's, so, it's such hard work. I mean, people always say to me, so where do you get all this stuff from? And I'm like, well, I, I work on relationships with people. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to build trust. They're not... They're not letting anyone going into the safe where they have like 400 rhino horns, <laughs> you know. You they, can't just like email them and say, hey, I'd like to come. They they, and they really check you out. I mean, they know everything about you. So they knew your complete photographic history and who you were. Yeah, I think they knew more about yeah. me than just my photographic history, to yeah. be honest, because they really sound you out. I mean, it's very difficult to get any of these places, basically. But then, of course, once you do that, then the next place is more open. Once you show the photos... Because then I actually went to Heathrow Airport, you know, UK, where I'm based myself, and said, look, I've done all that work in the US. Will you let me in and show me what you have? And then that took only a few months, actually. And, and, and now I have got a sort of relationship with them. And uh, so I send an email like, oh, what have you got recently? Or they have actually even also emailed me saying, you've got to come and see this, what we confiscated. So, so it, some of your work is from America and some from Heathrow. Yeah, and Germany. And and the place in Germany uh, is the Leibniz Institute. And they actually keep things from various places in Europe. So it's not only from Germany, confiscated. It's also other places, you know, where it sort of comes together for research and forensic tests and things. Yeah, DNA, you know, they kind of start, I mean, it's really complicated, but they have started a DNA database 
to establish, um, you know, where where is the species from? Was it captive? Was it wild? Um, and then they can, through that, track back, like, where it comes from. And then sometimes, you know, because also, so I work with crime experts who take fingerprints on ivory and rhino horn and, you know, all of these things now can be matched, you know. This is like, see, I tell you what is really beautiful about my work is that in 2017, I felt nobody even wanted to mention it. People were really tiptoeing around the subject. And now it's a serious crime. And that's just happened in a few years. Do you feel your photo your photographs have helped? I think, I mean, I like to think that I was a small part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I always say I feel like I see myself as a, as a small wheel in a hopefully greater movement. I don't think it's just down to my work, but it's probably down to like many people's work that comes together, you know. So, and, and some governments have really taken some excellent action on things. I mean, this country has done a lot in the last three, four years uh, in making things illegal. They were illegal, you know, like, let's say, 10 years ago. You can no longer trade this, and that's good. So, I mean, I think most countries are really beginning to understand because this is affecting all of us, you know. I mean, biodiversity loss means it's a suicide for us, literally. You know, humans are not going to survive this unless we change our attitudes. Mm. So exposure itself, I mean, it's your first time here. Give us the, give us the elevator pitch on exposure. And, Absolutely I mean, love it. <laughs> the big breath. Out. I mean, amazing, right? So, so blown away by it, really. Mm. I mean, I heard of it, of course, before some other photographers, some of my friends, photographers, we're all colleagues, we all talk you know, a lot. And they told me how amazing it was. And uh, so I was like, oh my God, when I was invited, I was like, oh. <laughs> no, I was so happy. And um yeah, I'm really blown away by the quality delivered. I mean, the exhibitions, never seen anything like it. I mean, yeah. the, the way it's put together, I mean, I think um, the team and, of course, you know, led by Simon is pretty mind-blowing. And, of course, you know, that uh, the, you know, his highness and the excellences have, like, supported this and that they're also here is just amazing. I mean, these, these people really give a, a, a voice to photographers and the photographers carry the voices of millions of people and animals from across the globe. Mm. So I think it's absolutely remarkable. This this festival is absolutely remarkable. And the access as well. I mean, I'm sure for must have been numerous people this week have just been so dying to meet you and come and talk to you about your exhibition and spend time with you. That must have been such a treat for them. Uh, yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's like a really excellent uh, place to network. It's really good to, because you have also enough time to sit down with people. Yeah, I mean, I have spent some time in my exhibition with just visitors who yeah, were really keen to understand more, you know, about it and like, yeah, how do I get access and all of that. And I mean, what was nice as well is that they said to me that they've never seen anything like it. It was completely new to them, you know, and they... That must feel good to you because that's what you strive for. Yeah, yeah. and people really spend time in my exhibit and literally, I mean, I watch people reading every caption, sitting down, taking it all in making notes, taking some photos, you know, and, and then filming themselves in the exhibit, walking around to share with their friends and family. And so, I mean, I think it's really resonating for a lot of people. I mean, the entire event, I think, is resonating. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think this can be extremely powerful to send a message across the globe, you know. <clears throat> this is not just a festival, you know, about art. It's actually to change the planet, you know, to make us all understand, you know, how precious everything is mm. and that we need to take some action. And I think the problem is a little bit that people feel so helpless. They don't know how to take action. But I think we need to kind of start talking a bit more about what each individual person can actually do. Um, mm. You know, kind of looking at all the, especially the conflict photographers who are here, had long conversation with, they're of course saying like, I, I risk my life every day and I'm, I can't see a change, you know, and... How can we make a change? And I think it's really about um, talking to individuals or making people understand that they need to kind of tick the right box when they do the votes for their presidents or, or their MPs. Mm. Uh, that's the really good start, I think. And then, of course, your everyday behavior, you know, of really everything influence. you do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, you know, there's sort of little things. So I fly a lot for my work and I feel kind of bad about it. But if I don't do it, then I can't do my work, you know, because my work is all about going to different places, either to document what's happening or, or to show what's happening. So, but because I do that, there's a lot of things I don't do. You know, for example, you know, I mean, I don't eat meat, I don't have a car, you know, because there's a lot of things I decided I can't do that. I don't want to do it. I mean, even like my shoes are, you know, kind of like 
sometimes look like. So is this is there a vegan version of this? <laughs> I mean, to the detail, you know, yeah, like yeah, you know, yeah. jumpers, whatever. I kind of feel like let's always try let's to do all something of us good. do something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, people laugh about me. I've got my, I've got a really old phone from 2016. I don't want to say the brand now, but you can probably guess it. But it's from 16, and it's really not working very well at all. <laughs> and everybody goes, get the really new one because the, because especially because the camera quality is so amazing. And then I borrowed the new one and I looked at it and I was like, I was almost crying thinking it is so amazing. But I did a project about coltan, which is the mineral used in phones to preserve the battery, so that'll put you to off, charge yeah. the battery. And I, I feel, no, I can only do the minimum. And I, I to be honest, I, I do a lot of stuff secondhand, you know, like devices, like computers, I buy second hand because either A, I don't want to feed more of the big brands <laughs> and, and B, I feel like it's not necessary, is it? You know, um, we don't need to have every year a new phone. But of course, like most of my colleagues laugh when I rock up with this old phone. <laughs> you know, as a photographer, Britta, please get yourself a new phone. <laughs> we want to be able to call you. But, yeah. uh, but I feel I can't do it. You see, if I wouldn't fly so much, I would always say, yeah, I get a phone. So for me, it's a little bit like I'm trading, you know, kind of like, okay, if I do this, I don't allow myself doing that. Yeah, but like you say, you have to go and you have to tell these stories to the world. So, well, Britta... Yes. Thanks for stopping by to see us. We could probably sit here and go on for another couple of days. This is just amazing. I mean, um, we're really pleased you came to see us, having a great time at Exposure, and we'll hopefully we'll see, we'll see you soon. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank, thank you. you.